So, following our common property rights, which we call as CPR, which we discussed at previous lecture. Today, I am going to discuss with you a, a paper, which has been written by none other than Garrett Hardin. And uh, this gentleman actually has talked about a topic, which many people at that point of time was actually afraid to discuss. Now, here the title of this paper is tragedy of common. Now, in the previous lecture, we discussed about common property right, where we have you know discussed many common property, which actually give lot of you know value and uses to the community. But when we actually utilize it fully or when that particular natural resource get exhausted of its further you know delivery or benefit for society, then nobody owns it, because everybody thinks that this is not mine and a lack of ownership prevails. As an example, a river say for our Ganga, Ganga river. Now, as long as Ganga river is flowing, water is clean, we are utilizing for various other purposes in our life. But the moment, because of our activity, anthropogenic activity, river Ganga becomes suppose, you know, contaminated, unclean, then nobody comes to say, no, I will clean it. So, today I am going to discuss this paper, which at some point of time, some of the, you know, words you might feel that it is bit harsh, but that is the harsh reality. I will today, you know, share this particular paper with you in the mode of a tutorial among this MOOC lecture. So, you will see that when, when you read this paper, I would encourage all of you, it is available, it is open access. In Google, you can search this paper and can download and can read. Every time you read this paper, you will find, you know, better clarity about the subject. Why? Why? this author is calling tragedy. Now, what actually authors actually tries to say here? If you read this paper, he starts talking about population. As you see here, he says that population problem has no technical solution. It requires a fundamental extension in morality. Now, also in paper, he actually argues and he asks the readers means us, what actually we should maximize? Should we maximize population or should we maximize the utilization of the resources that nature has given to us? Now, if you see that uh, Malthus, he said that natural, you know, the way population grow, it is geometric in nature or exponentially, you can say. In finite world, this means that per capita share of the world's goods must steadily decrease. But the question is that, is our ours a finite world? Do you think that our world is finite? You will see that a fair defense, some people, some thinkers, they put forward for the view that world is infinite. In terms of the practical problems that we must face in the next few generation, with the you know advent of different technology, it is almost clear that we will you know greatly increase human misery. If we do not at least during the immediate future start assuming that world available to the terrestrial human or human species population is a finite. You cannot continue you know extracting the world resources. So, this paper actually written late 60s. So, you can imagine that how author so many years back, when the world population was not as much as today, even though he could visualize that in which direction the mankind was moving. People you know started thinking about that the world is you know infinite, 
but here Garrett is actually arguing and also some other thinkers they said that if we continue utilizing the, the resources which is available in, in this earth, in this world thinking that the world is infinite, we are going to get into problem. So, a finite world can support only finite population. This is a very, very important statement that you know we should always remember that a finite world can support only finite population. Therefore, population growth must eventually equal to 0. Now, is that possible? We need to actually think about this particular statement that is made here. So, the argument is that if the world is finite or world can support only a finite population. If you consider that world is finite, then it can support only finite population. It cannot be that a finite world can continue support a infinite population. So, if you for time being you accept the fact that the world is finite and it will support finite population, in that case population growth must eventually equal to 0. When this condition is met, what will be the situation of mankind? Just imagine. Specifically, can Bentham's goal of the greatest good for the greatest number be realized? Because Bentham was said this statement that the greatest good for the greatest number, but can that be realized in this kind of situation? Garrett thinks it is not possible for two reasons. What are those? Each sufficient by itself. The first is a theoretical one. It is not mathematically possible to maximize for two or more variables at the same time. This was clearly stated by Van Neumann and Morgenstern. But the principle is implicit in the theory of partial differential equation. The second reason the second reason springs directly from biological fact. If we wish to live any organism per se, to live to survive must have a source of energy which comes from food. Now, this energy is utilized for two purposes. One is mere maintenance and the other is work. So, you maintain your system and you work for these two reasons, two purposes our energy is required. For us, for men, maintenance of life requires about 1600 kilocalories a day. Remember, these are the things which have been mentioned in 1960s, late 1960s. So, there will be certain differences in many requirements and things today. Why I am sharing this, you know, little so called controversial paper? because this will give you also the other perspective of common property right. Here, Garrett Hardin actually clearly says that if you do not control your population rate of growth of population, there is a chance that you will get perished. Now, to you know establish his argument, he has mentioned given many example and that is why it is important that we should look at this paper very critically. Anything that a person does over and above merely staying alive will be defined as work all right? and that is supported by work calories which he takes in through food. Now, work calories are used not only for what we call work in common speech. They are also required for all forms of enjoyment in our life, starting from suppose swimming, playing soccer, cycling, for anything that you actually entertain yourself, some amusement that also requires certain amount of energy. If our goal is to maximize population, it is obvious that we must do it. We must make the work calories per person as close to 0 as possible. Now, no meals, no vacation, 
no sports, no music, no literature, no artistic activity. I think that everyone will grant without argument or proof that maximizing population does not maximize goods. So, Bentham goal is impossible. Now, in reaching these conclusions, Gadin say that he has assumed that it is a acquisition of energy, that you know it is the acquisition of energy that is the problem. The appearance of atomic energy has led some to question this particular assumption. However, if you look at that the arithmetic signs in the analysis as it were it was reversed and Bentham goals is still unobtainable. So, the optimum population is then what? Less than the maximum. The difficulty you know in defining the optimum is always very, very difficult. So, so far as Garrett Hardin is concerned in this paper, he says that no one has seriously talked about this particular problem of you know defining optimum population in the world. So, how much actually this earth can carry? Now, if you recall that in one of the previous classes we discussed about carrying capacity, where we talked about that you know when how long the you know the earth or the globe can actually carry. So, you talked about you know S curve, J curve, as long as the supply is available the population will grow. At certain point when the supply gets diminished population also will start going down. Now, when population goes down then again the supply seems you know increasing. So, again population will grow up. So, this is the way this is the way actually you know population goes up and down with the availability of resources. Now, if you look at the tragedy of commons develops particularly say an example which Gareth has given a pasture, a green pasture, a green grassland which is open to all. Now, it is to be you know expected that each you know person who has cows or lambs or goats will try to keep as many cattle as possible on that common land. Now, this kind of arrangement may work reasonably you know satisfactorily for centuries because of you know various kind of conflict and other thing population if it goes down as I discussed here. Then it, it will seem like that the supply of resources again high. So, again you know population will go up, but finally comes the day when the long desired goal of social stability becomes a reality. And at this point the inherent logic of the commons remorselessly generates tragedy. Why? Because suppose in a piece of land where a person was actually having his own suppose five goat till the time he is there with five goats that particular green pasture look enough for him. And so, from 5 he got 7, 8 like that because this group of goats started reproducing, population started increasing. Up to certain point still this pasture was sufficient enough for him to continue with this practice, but other day another person comes in. As this place is a open place nobody can stop. So, that person also come with suppose 5 goat. Similar way now these goats also start eating on feeding on these grasses and they also reproduce. So, imagine there will be a competition, competition for foods. Now, both the person now will try to maximize the benefit out of that green pasture. So, what you can visualize tell me. Now, these two person of course, till one point they will be able to maintain a peaceful you know stay there, but after some time if both of their goats produce reproduce more or another person come in, then the supply of raw material like grasses will be less 
and the number of goats will be more and there the conflict will start. Who will share the benefit and who will not? Now, each herdsman will try to maximize his gain explicitly or implicitly. Now, each one of them will start asking themselves, what is the utility to me of adding one more animal to my herd? They started with five, they will you know start thinking, what is the utility if I add one more? Now, this utility has one negative and one positive component and what is that? The positive component is a function of the environment of one animal. Since that herd man receives all the you know proceeds from the you know sale of the additional animal, the positive utility is nearly plus one. But the negative component is a function of the additional overgrazing created by one extra animal into that grassland. Now, the effect of overgrazing are shared by all herdsmen. There are now one or two herdsmen, they both of them brought. So, both of them will actually share you know the overgrazing effect. So, that means every individual goat will get little less grass than previous time. So, the negative utility for any particular decision making herdsman is only a fraction of minus 1. Now, if you add plus 1 and minus 1, the rational herdsman concludes that the only sensible course for him to pursue is to add another animal to his herd and another means there comes the problem. He keeps on adding number of animal in that particular pasture. But this is the conclusion reached by each and every rational herdsman while sharing a common property, common grassland and there is the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his or her herd without any limit. In a world where resources are finite and if people start expecting or you know extracting infinite amount of limitless amount of benefit out of those resources, destruction is inevitable. So, ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, that is what Garin is saying. Each one of them pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom in a commons brings ruins to all. This is a most important statement that I wish all of you to understand. He says that by doing this kind of practice, you got a one piece of green pasture which is common to all. So, I bring five goat, you bring five goat and then after some time I feel okay, my benefit has to grow. So, I add another in my group. So, that means six six goat, my friend also neighbor also add another one. He says, I also need benefit, extra benefit. So, this is the way we start you know adding one after other animal to enhance our benefit and exploit that green pasture as much as possible. And we forget for time being that that green grass is limited, finite. So, certainly that is what Garrett here argues that this is the way we actually move towards the destruction. And why? Because this society has given full freedom to use anything which are common. So, any common property like our river Ganga, who will stop you to go there and take a bath or use the you know Ganga water, oxygen that we breathe in, till now it is common property. Now, you just go there and you burn something in your garden, you know that smoke will certainly will will take away some oxygen from the surrounding environment but you feel it, that is your right because within within your property you are doing but when the same activity is done in somewhere when there is a you know property which is no one's common free land so there comes you know the kind of feeling that world is infinite 
so you use as much as you can and that that is what is dangerous because that will lead towards you know towards ruin as he said in this paper so he says that the freedom in this society to utilize common property actually will bring everyone to destruction or ruin that is what he has presented in this paper so i brought this uh, paper today to discuss with you so that you yourself can you know understand that whether garrett is right or wrong or some of his views are right or wrong so this actually will open our thinking process with regard to the you know the right to common properties and how it should be utilized he also says that some probably would say that this is a you know platitude kind of thing in a sense that it it is learned that thousands of years ago uh, you know by natural selection favors the forces of psychological denial now the individual benefits uh, you know as an individual from his ability to deny the truth even though society as a whole of which he or she is a part of that society will also suffer because of one person or two persons you know individual benefit some other person in the society will suffer now this kind of understanding garrett has put almost 60 see 1960s late 60s so you can imagine that the kind of thinking that he had at that point of time now he also says that education can counter attack this natural tendency of us to do wrong thing but the inexorable succession of generation requires that the basis for this knowledge be constantly refreshed very very critical statement we cannot stay stagnant as far as knowledge is concerned exploration of new knowledge new facts should always you know get refreshed new things should come into the system then he goes on and he shares you know a few more example now another example that garrett brings in is about pollutions and you will see how nicely he can explain this particular uh, aspect he says that the tragedy of commons reappears in problems of pollutions how say in sewage you know in a city any place there is a process that our waste material from our household goes to a certain place and then get treated now similar way suppose you have a river which is passing through your you know neighborhood and that river is common now if you staying next to the river decides to throw the waste which is generated at your household into the river now unless until there is a strict rule or regulation you will continue doing that because again that river is not your property you feel it is everyone's it's common so you behave in a different way similar way our air which is common so that air can also be intoxicated by different activities but when it impacts the air intoxicate the air then it is going to impact thousands millions of people so one or two individual you know activity can impact almost the entire society now the tragedy of commons as a food basket is averted by private property or something formally like it but the air and waters surrounding us can readily be fenced and so the tragedy of the commons as a cesspool must be prevented by different means by coercive laws taxing devices that make it cheaper for the polluter to treat his pollutants then to discharge them untreated into the water body which is common so in a sense that morality is a system sensitive you know aspect and that's why garrett also says that the consciousness of people the consciousness morality of individual has a very important role to play to make the common property you know useful as well as maintain in appropriate manner otherwise certainly 
it is a tragedy and it is tragedy of common. Now, the next thing again Garrett in this paper, he mentioned a very important point and that is that prohibition is easy to legislate, but how do we legislate temperance? He says that experience indicates that it can be accomplished based through you know the mediations of administrative law. We can also limit the possibilities unnecessarily if we suppose that the sentiment of you know quis custodiate denies us the use of administrative law. Now, this he said at his condition in 19, late 1960s. What he means is that whether government at any particular point of time can legislate something, can bring in some law, rule and regulation and thus can actually stop the people to mistreat the common property. That is what he is trying to mean. Now, if you see that in around late 1967, some 30 countries, 30 nations, they agreed to the following. What is that? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights describes the family as the natural and fundamental unit of a society. It follows that any choice and decision with regard to the size of the family must irrevocably rest with the family itself and it cannot be made by anyone else. Such a profound you know thinking. Now, 30 nations in 1967 agreed to this following resolution. Now, it is painful you know to have to deny categorically the validity of this right, denying it one may feel as uncomfortable as a resident of any particular city. So, if you look at the long term you know impact of any you know rule or regulation brought in by legislation to somehow you know maintain the natural or the common properties for the longer uses potential long uses of these common properties for larger benefit of larger society. It is important that while having the common property right certain amount of you know regulation should also be in place. He also argued at one point that the conscience, conscience means you know our inner consciousness or the desire for children is hereditary. Everyone, every you know organism in this ecosystem wants to procreate, procreation is the reality of life, but hereditary only in the most general form and sense. The result will be the same whether the attitude of you know father is transmitted to the son or son's characteristic transmitted to his son. So, this result will be completely uh, dependent on hereditary. If one denies the later possibility as well as the former, then what is the point of education? This is the questions you know he asks. So, at this juncture, the argument that Garrett brings in, in the context of population problem, but this also applies equally well to any instant in which society appeals to an individual exploiting commons or common property to restrain himself for the general good by means of his own conscience. So, ultimately it boils down to self consciousness. So, the population, the increase of population, a population problem, how to actually regulate that, this you know can be left to the conscious of an individual. So, this is a kind of a you know, you know very sensitive topic, sensitive aspect that Garrett also uh, wanted to you know bring in into public domain. Now, there are various other aspects that in this uh, paper Garrett Hardin has discussed about say the pathogenic effects of conscience. What he says is that the long term disadvantage of an you know appeal towards conscious conscience should be enough to condemn it. If we ask a man who is suppose exploiting a common property in the name of conscience, what are you saying to him? What does he hear? The you know 
you will see that even if you say about his utilization of natural lessos beyond his requirement or need, this gentleman will remember not merely the words we used, but also the non-verbal communication cues that we have give him unawares. Sooner or later, consciously or unsubconsciously, that man will sense that he has received two type of communication and that are contradictory in nature. One is intended communication. If you do not do as we ask, we will openly condemn you for not acting like a responsible citizen. That is one, that is the intended communication. Two, the unintended communication means which we did not want to actually communicate, but still it got communicated to the person. What is this? If you do behave as we ask, we will secretly condemn you for a simpleton who can be shamed into standing aside while the rest of us exploit the commons. See, what does this mean? Is that suppose one person who has listened this, he may be standing, he may be not stopped utilizing or stop what you call misusing the resources, common resources, but others will keep on doing it. So, how to control this kind of situation? So, here Garrett called it that pathogenic effects of concise. So, every man then is caught in what Bateson has called it double bind. Bateson and his co-workers have made a plausible case for viewing the double bind as an important causative factor in the genesis of schizophrenia. The double bind may not always you know endangers the mental health of anyone to whom it is applied. A bad conscience is a kind of a illness. Nietzsche, another researcher has said that a bad conscience is a kind of illness. So, from up to this point what we actually find in this you know very thought provocative paper is that authors are talking about various kind of exploitation or say utilization of resources and then how you know a tragedy is there because of you know the freedom to use maximum I should say the maximum utilizations of the common properties for the benefit of few. And then how because of various activities we create pollutions and thus the common property which otherwise can be used by you know most of the people in the society they cannot use it because it got polluted because of certain actions or over exploitation. Now then he also talked about legislations how government can bring in legislations to regulate the exploitations of common properties and then he talks about the population problem how the you know self conscious can actually dictate the decision to increase populations or regulate it in a proper manner. Now, conscious is a very you know sensitive matter where when you communicate some message he says one person may get your intended message the other person may not. So, the person who actually supposed to get the message he does not, but the other person get and he stops suppose utilizing that particular common property, but the other people still continue exploiting that common property. Does it help? No, it does not. So, in that case another author he says that a bad conscious is a kind of illness. So, it must be rectified very strong you know statement, but imagine that this kind of a very critical thinking started taking place in 1965, 66 that point of time. So, even that point of time these are the people they understood or imagine that in which direction the world is moving and the crisis of natural resources, the conflict among different society these things they could imagine and that is why they warned the society that if proper care and proper you know steps have not been taken then the mankind will approach towards a ruin. But of course, we are still moving things are still somehow being managed, but the fact is that various other natural resources 
are getting somehow exhausted from the ecosystem. So, perhaps the time has come that we revisit this kind of paper written in 1960, 65, 66, when population of this world was almost half of what we have today or at least you know much less than what we have today. So, that is what I would again request all of you that download this particular paper and read it very carefully. So, we will continue uh, discussing this paper and in the next paragraph or next sections, Gary talks about mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon system, the social arrangements which actually produce the responsibility that create coercion. So, that that a man who takes money from a bank acts as if the bank were the commons. How do we prevent such kind of action? Certainly, we cannot do it by trying to control his behavior by verbal appeal or by you know to his sense of responsibility rather than rely on you know certain propaganda. If we see that uh, in certain cases a definite social arrangements can be made which can actually keep it from becoming a commons and thereby infringe on the freedom of would be robbers we neither deny and nor regret. Means, the bank where we put our, our money, hard earned money that should not become one day like a you know common property. So, the author is actually trying to you know mean that some of the you know resources, some of the natural resources that we have in our system, it is like stored in that system which can be utilized as per the requirement, as per its you know utilization, proper utilization should be taken place. Not like that, whenever somebody wants it, just take it you know from the system. Here comes the again the morality, the point of morality that you know Garrett Hardin mentioned at the very beginning that utilization, extraction, exploitation of resources from our ecosystem largely depends on morality. Now, if the morality of bank robbing is particularly easy to understand because we accept, we accept complete prohibition of this activity. But at the same time, we can have a system like taxing, taxing, taxing could be a good coercive device to keep the shoppers you know in their use of parking space introducing parking meters, short periods and traffic fines for longer duration of stay. So, that means here Garrett is telling that directly approaching to the robber, bank robber and requesting him for his you know conscious or morality that may not work we know that. So, instead of that he is now thinking about certain you know other tools or mechanism like tax or having some kind of uh, system which actually will you know allow a kind of a prohibitory you know system for, for the bank robbers to think that the bank is of common. So, if you look at that under this kind of situation where you mutually agreed upon certain condition of question. Question is not to say that we are required to enjoy it or even to pretend that we enjoy. Tell me who enjoys tax, the taxation, anybody, any one of us enjoy it. So, we all actually you know uh, feel unhappy when we pay taxes. There are very few people may be who very happily paying taxes. Now, but we accept the compulsory taxes because we recognize that voluntary taxes would favor the conscience less. Means, if you make taxing system voluntarily, the people who do not have conscious, self conscious, definitely they will decide not to pay tax. So, in that kind of system in society, it will be very difficult to run the system, run the development work. So, in that kind of condition, government or country institute and support taxes and other coercive devices to escape the horror of the commons. Means, everything if we start thinking that okay, this is common property, 
use it, then one day it will be very difficult actually to run the system, to run the government. The financial ecosystem will be totally destroyed and that is why in this paper Garrett has says tragedy of commons. So, please try to understand that uh, common property, common you know uh, sources of natural resources which are useful for our life, useful many people can actually build their livelihood on that. But as long as the thinking is there that these are common properties, so take it. I give an, an example, any one of you are coming from you know mountainous region, you might have seen that uh, people go up there in the morning and then uh, you know midday they will come down with lot of biomasses wood on their back because they are going to use those for cooking food. Now, these are these these practice are going on for, for many many years. As long as you know you take that much only which is required for you is still ok, but when the population is very high and everyone thinks that I am taking only little bit for me that little bit becomes huge amount and the day will come that the entire forest is totally vanished and that is also another tragedy of common because nobody thought of regenerating plants there. Everybody went for the you know ready made mature plant, sometime even immature plant, cut it, bring it home, dry it and use it for different domestic purposes. So, the thing here that I am trying to put in front of you because we discussed in previous lecture about common property right. So, I thought that let us you know discuss something from a different completely angle and this is the paper which gives you a totally different perspective. Here Garrett in every example he argues strongly that the thinking of common actually is not very good or conducive for our society you know to thrive. So, if you now look at that another point that he makes in this paper is that a recognition of necessity means to understand or recognize that something is necessity without that you cannot survive. The simplest summary of this analysis of man's population's problem is this according to Garrett says the commons if justifiable at all is justifiable only under conditions of low population density. Just now what I said about collecting wood from the forest in mountainous region or elsewhere. As long as the population is less, you can still justify you know justify the utilizations or justify the necessity of cutting wood from the forest. Because the as the population increases, the commons has had to be abandoned in one aspect or other that is what I just said the wood. So, 1 percent, 2 percent, 3 percent ok, but when it becomes 300 or so, everybody will take little little amount and but one day we will see the forest is totally gone. So, even though you, you know you recognize that it is necessary for that particular individual, but when that number of individual the population gets increased, then again the concept of common need to be relook at. So, first we abandoned the commons in food gathering, enclosing farming and restricting pastures and hunting and fishing areas. Because if we do not do that, then what will happen? Everybody will think that that pond belongs to everyone. So, I can go there, I can fish as much as I wish, I can go there, I can take 10 goat and leave them there to eat grasses. All of us we know in India in certain village areas or you know nearby jungle areas, if you pass through even a high road, you will find that hundreds of cows you know are going through the road. Why? Because they have been left like that to go in the green pasture land, eat grasses. But when the milk comes, individual gain or profit is going to, in, to, to, to few, few persons or few households. But because of you know huge number of cows again population 
one or two cows go there and eat some grasses come back no problem it will get regenerated. But when this large number of you just leave them and they grow and eat out the grass. So, definitely in one week or 10 days even the grasses also will get over. So, this is the point that every time you know if you say that it is common property then we will end up one day losing most of the precious resources that we have in our ecosystem. So, one should actually you know keep in mind that Hegel another thinker he said once freedom is the recognition of necessity very very important statement. The most important aspect of necessity that we must now recognize is the necessity of abandoning the commons in breeding. No technical solution can rescue us from the misery of overpopulation. This is what you know Garrett said and these are the statement which at that point of time 1965-66 actually created a hue and cry in the society. Someone coming and telling that do not produce too much. Even at, at one point he said that if you continue producing like that way the doomsday is not very far. So, people certainly at that point of time did not like some of his thought and ideas statements. So, he says that freedom to breed will bring ruin to all. Just try to imagine those days mid 60s to state this kind of statement in United States of America is not an easy thing. Freedom to breed will bring ruin to all. What actually he meant is that if, if you give freedom to everyone that you produce, produce and produce as many as you want. So, the population will reach to a certain level that we will fight for every resources, especially the issue with the common resources and then and then you will find that the tragedy of common. This is what Garrett Herdin has argued in this paper which actually become a famous piece for natural resource uh, study, social study and he also you know says that that the only way that perhaps we can preserve, nurture other and more precious freedom is by relinquishing the freedom to breed. See imagine the kind of statement and then he says that that is why he said freedom is the recognition of necessity and it is the role of you know education to reveal to all the necessity of abandoning the freedom to breed. And he thinks, he opines only so that we can put an end to this aspect of the tragedy of the commons. So, the final conclusions is that please do not give the freedom to breed, make the society recognize to abandon the freedom to breed means you leave the freedom to breed just like anything because perhaps that is the only way that you control the population. If population is under control then the tragedy of the common may be avoided or we may be able to end this tragedy of commons. Mm -hmm.